All right, so I'm back. Apologies for that little interlude there. Um, we need to talk about the last form of synthetic speech, which is uh, based on articulatory synthesis. So um, again, the idea here is that for articulatory synthesis, you create a model of the vocal tract, and then you also have to create a model of how the vocal tract shape translates into a specific acoustic signal. Um, we've talked about that, uh, at least when we discussed the perturbation theory model of how vowels are produced as well as the tube model of how vowels are produced. So it's using that um, as kind of the way to make the articulation to acoustics transfer, transfer but sort of more fundamentally than that, uh, there has to be a model of how you move the articulators around when you're producing speech. Uh, we kind of alluded to that a little bit in this class when we discussed, say, the different muscles that uh, control the vocal tract and the tongue, uh, the jaw, so on and so forth. So uh, actually, in order to be able to actually get one of these models to work, you have to flesh that out in a meaningful way. Haha, ha, flesh it out. Um, but you have to be able to specify how specific instructions to your uh, muscles and articulators transfer into different articulatory gestures and then from the gestures into different acoustic signals on the output of it. Um, so there's a lot that has to go into this, which is maybe why it's... Um, not studies studies as much. It's more uh, value, I would say, for our scientific understanding of how people produce speech and how um, articulation relates to acoustics. Uh, so um, people are usually more interested in those uh, practical applications of synthetic speech that I mentioned in the previous slide. Um, so they focus more on that rather than looking at sort of just these um, models of intellectual interest. Uh, so here's an example of an early attempt of this. A, B, C, 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 F, G, H, I, J, K, L, N, M, N, O, P, U, R, S, T, U, V, W, X, Y, Z, O, R, F, P, C, C, B, when we know our A, B, C. Yeah, so um, that sounds a little bit like the earlier examples of like form and synthesis that we heard um, before in the previous part of this lecture, uh, but it's based on an articulatory model instead. That one always cracks me up because um, they didn't say elemento in the middle of the alphabet uh, and instead like walked through each of the letters step by step there in the middle. And I guess the reason why is because they couldn't mess around with the rhythm that well. Um, with uh, whatever instruction set they had on hand for that um, articulatory synthesis model. The one articulatory synthesis model I want you to sh <clears throat> I want to show to you though is the one that's in prot uh, and this is kind of fun. So we can go to prot and I'll show you how to get to it, which is to just look in the manual for uh, articulatory synthesis. And what you will get is a um, tutorial on how to get the articulatory synthesis package in PROT to work. Um, so this walks you through some step-by-step -step instructions of how to produce um, the sequence UPA um, using this articulatory synthesis package. Um, so this is a little bit involved, so bear with me as I um, put this together. So, oh yeah, I guess you can get through it this way too. Just go to new articulatory synthesis, uh, and the first thing we'll do is create a speaker uh, and we'll just leave it at the default settings here for a female. Um, she's got two tubes in her glottis. Uh, it could be a male or a child as well, but let's just go with that. Um, then we'll create an articulation <clears throat> using that. Oops, sorry. I don't want to do that. I want to create an art word. Totally different. Yeah, so hollow, and it will be 0.5 seconds long. Um, I kind of glommed over that real quickly when I was creating that. You can change the duration right here, but it's already the length that we want it to be. So now that we have a speaker and an art word, we will edit the art word. So here's what's kind of fun about this. Like I said, this is detailed and it's kind of complicated, but the basic principles shouldn't be that hard to figure out. <clears throat> once you've seen an example. So um, over here you see 
a lot, a lot of muscles which control the articulators in speech. And um, many of these are muscles that we have talked about in our discussion of the vocal tract anatomy. So playing around with these could give you um, a nice little review of which mus muscles control which articulators um, in speech. All we need to do for this one though is um, basically create a P in the middle of two schwas. And schwa is kind of like the default vowel articulation, so we don't have to do a whole lot for that. So to get it, um, this art word to actually say something, the first thing we'll do is set the interarytenoid activity to 0.5 throughout the utterance. <clears throat> so at zero, its value is 0.5, which means that we bring the vocal folds together, and then we set it to be that value throughout the entire utterance, so it just stays there. All right, so there's our interarytenoid activity, bringing the vocal folds together. To prevent air escaping through the nose, we need to close off that nasal pharyngeal port by setting the levator palatini to one throughout the utterance. So at zero, it's gonna be one. And at 0 0.5, it's gonna be one still. So we're raising the velum to close off air from going through the nose. To generate the lung pressure needed for phonation, you set the lungs activity to be zero at 0 0.2 seconds. Sorry, at zero seconds, you set it to be 0 0.2 for the lungs. So we're breathing out using that. And at 0.1 seconds, it's gonna be zero. So we'll do that. Um, okay, so air is coming out of our lungs, going through the mouth, and it's voicing as it does so. To force a jaw movement that closes the lips, set the mastered activity to 0.25, at 0.25 seconds to 0.7. So 0.25, we're going to raise the jaw. This is a little bit after we um, closed off uh, the lungs activity. Um, but I guess we'll still have air flowing through. Uh, but the other thing we need to do to get the P closure in the middle is to bring the lips together using the orbicularis oris. And at 0.25 seconds, we'll set that value at 0.2, so it just peaks up a little bit. Okay, and then we're done with that. So we'll select the speaker and the art word, and we'll click movie, and we'll see what looks like two lips coming together from a mid-sagittal view. Um, and that's kind of what we want. So this is our default kind of a shape for schwa, and we'll get a P. What does it sound like, though? So we can create speech from scratch here. We're gonna go, we'll click both of these and go to two sound. You can just leave these at their default settings and it's gonna do a lot of calculations and then come up with a sound. And let's turn it up. What did we get out of this? <laughs> okay, not too bad. <laughs> yep, and this is what it looks like. <laughs> it's got a little bit of creaky voice in there. <laughs> and maybe a little bit too much frication here in the middle, but maybe it's up uh, or something like that. Um, I haven't played around with this that much. I'm presuming we can just create a new speaker. Maybe we can make a male speaker and see what happens. Um, yeah, and then we should be able to put these two together and create a sound in the same way, but it should sound different. A little lower pitched maybe. Yeah. Um, Still getting some F here, so we can tweak with that. <clears throat> I had one student for um, her final project for the semester in this class who just spent all semester playing around with this synthesis package and was able to get it to do um, some pretty cool natural sounding things after a lot of work in creating these articulations. So uh, this is workable. It's functional in terms of um, the articul articulatory model it allows you to play with. Um, so I'd encourage you to play with it if you are interested in that at all. And I think, like I said, if nothing else, you get kind of a good review of what muscles control what um, when you create these um, articulations. Uh, yeah, but this is obviously hard. It's complicated. Um, uh, and again, it's sort of mostly for intellectual interest. Uh, but that's the last form of synthesis um, that we can think about. We can also think about synthetic speech perception. And this is gonna go through some notes that I've mentioned already. But in the early days of synthetic speech, speech scientists thought that synthetic speech would lead to a form of super speech, uh, which is kind of ideal speech without any of the extraneous noise of natural production. So this will give you sort of like 
their prototype values of speech um, without sort of the mess of the variability uh, that we always encounter in speech. But as we've learned, natural speech will always sound better than intel than and more intelligible than synthetic speech. Um, and people want that variability, basically. Uh, they can kind of draw on it to help them understand what's being said. Uh, and it also just sounds like what people are used to, right? Um, turns out that uh, if you do listen to synthetic speech, you're not going to be able to understand it as easily, depending on what type of speech you're listening to. It's going to be harder to understand the natural speech, but you can get better with it um, if you listen to it a lot. Right. Uh, so if you add more and more exemplars to your sort of synthetic speech categories, um, you should be able to start figuring it out with more ease. Uh, it helps if you have lots of variability as well, like words and phonemes and different contexts, so on and so forth. You'll get better with, uh, with synthetic speech perception if you uh, encounter those sorts of variables. Uh, another example is what happens when listeners are blind. So they will often so blind listeners, it's kind of uh, a great thing about the modern world is that we can use computer systems to read out any sort of um, text, right? Uh, so if you're blind, this is uh, something you might want to make use of on a regular basis. Uh, so some blind listeners, if they use synthetic speech a lot, um, these are people totally different from Darren Flynn, but if they use or listen to synthetic speech a lot, they will become expert listeners at it. And like I said, as is the case with Professor Flynn, they will often want to listen to it at a very high rate of speed um, because they can get that information out of the speech very quickly. Uh, and what's the point of waiting around? Because <clears throat> the computer doesn't have to like worry about itself. You just make it do whatever you want it to do, and you can get that information in a totally different way from having to listen to somebody else speak, like, say, your professor for phonetics. Um, so I've got some examples of some early work that was done on the intelligibility of synthetic speech systems um, from a variety of different platforms. So this is from the early 80s. Uh, and if you recall, <clears throat> uh, Dennis Klatt's Klatt Talk was converted into something called Deck Talk. Uh, and this actually shows you Deck Talk with like different voices. So this is Perfect Paul and Beautiful Betty. Uh, but this is just looking at how um, intelligible different messages were as produced by the system, like how many times would people screw up in trying to identify what was being said by different uh, speech synthesizers. So I've got examples here. Deck Talk was the best, which is why it's still kind of the standard for like form and synthesis to this day. Natural speech people hardly um, mess up at all, but there is a difference here throughout this graph between what are called closed format messages, which are messages from a limited set of options and then open format which is you'd have no idea ahead of time what the uh, system or the speaker is going to say so this is the prose system four hours of steady work faced us a large size in stockings is hard to sell the boy was there when the sun rose so those are some examples of the same sentences that the, that the haskins pattern playback synthesizer produced a long time ago uh, like four hours of steady work faced us. And I think most of these are fairly intelligible. Four hours of steady work faced us. A large size in stockings is hard to sell. The boy was there when the sun rose. So these will get progressively worse as we go in this direction. Speech is so familiar, a feature of daily life, that we rarely pause to define it. It seems as natural to man as walking, and only less so than breathing. Yet it needs but a moment's reflection to convince us that this naturalness of speech is but an illusory feeling. So that's the MI talk system, which is Dennis Klatt's system basically before it became upgraded to Deck Talk. Uh, this is Infobox. The SA101 is built around the 68 microcomputer, the MC68000, and the signal processor, the NVC7720. The device can easily be connected to a normal computer terminal. So as you can see, things are starting to get worse already. This is the worst version, the Echo Synthesis Package. The birch panels lit on the smooth lamps. Illumashi to the dark blue background. It's easy to tell the depth of a well. These days a chip and lab is a rare dish. So it kind of pops out at you when it says like, or to me at least, when he says, it says, it's easy to tell the depth of a well, um, or these days a chicken leg is a rare dish, whatever uh, it said at the end there. Those make sense because I've heard them before in synthetic voices. Uh, I think this is the Votrack system from here, which is also bad. 
Tattoos of Lemons made fine bunch. The box was thrown beside a part of... <clears throat> yeah, I'll just mention, um, as an aside, that uh, the Votrack system was like the voice of the video game character Qbert, and Qbert is like a classic video game which has been lost to the sands of time. So people still remember like Pac-Man or I think maybe Space Invaders, uh, some basic early 80s games like that. But um, so for a while, Qbert was very popular, but Qbert is gone. Um, but once upon a time when I was looking up data, like some information on these various speech synthesizers to see what had happened to them, um, I came across like this uh, article written by one of the guys who created the Qbert um, character and game and uh, said that Votrax was like the only synthesis system that the company was willing to shell out money for because it was so cheap. Uh, and they just like couldn't stand how poor it was in terms of its quality, um, which is kind of funny to think about. Because I don't have a problem just thinking that's Qbert's voice, basically. But to understand what that means, you'd have to play Qbert, or at least speak and spell, I suppose. Um, form and synthesis tends to produce better vowels uh, when people look at how well these things are perceived. Uh, concatenative synthesis will tend to produce better consonants and transitions. Um, because it kind of incorporates that transition, transition information uh, between phonemes in it uh, through just recording the natural versions of them. Um, yeah, another fact about synthetic speech perception is that it tends to use up more mental resources. Uh, so they learned this by um, asking listeners to sort of recall lists of numbers and words um, that are produced to them, presented to them in synthetic speech voices. Uh, and it's harder to do that with synthetic speech than with natural speech. You just have to like do more processing to sort of, sort of store that information if you're hearing it in a not natural voice. Um, so that's another disadvantage of this form of speech. Uh, it's also a lot easier for native speakers of a language to understand synthetic speech. Uh, which you may have encountered when I played you that French uh, example um, not too long ago uh, in the first part of this slide. Uh, adults do better with synthetic speech than children do. And then older listeners, interestingly, prefer slower rates of speech. I guess that's simply a function of how they process time. Uh, but like I said, you can often, like a lot of expert listeners of synthetic speech will want to sort of crank the rate up as high as it can go, but I guess older listeners, not so much. Um, there's also some efforts that have been made at audiovisual speech synthesis. Uh, and again, these are some examples from a while ago, so they may have um, progressed, but uh, these are kind of fun to look at anyways. Uh, so uh, one guy who has worked hard on this is um, a professor named Dominic Massaro at UC Santa Cruz over in California. Uh, so he created a character named Baldi, uh, and we'll look at a couple of examples here of Baldi saying things. Um, yeah. So, yeah, here's Baldi. Hi, my name is Baldi, and I speak English. So, uh, not too bad. Hi, my name is Baldi, and I speak English. Not really clear why Baldi doesn't have hair, but maybe that's computationally expensive. There's a Baldette character that does have hair. Hi. My name is Baldette, and I speak English. Or there's a French version. Bonjour, je m'appelle Baldi, et je parle français. Yeah, so um, that's not too bad. Uh, I can let you know that some of the basic findings of um, audiovisual synthetic speech perception are that you can get the McGurk effect out of those synthetic visuals even if they're not as you know great as you get in natural speech. Uh, and they also pr improve the perception of speech and noise, but just not as well as um, natural visuals do. Um, and I showed you some examples there, but it's basically the same thing that you'd expect out of natural speech, but just not quite as good, right? Um, yeah, so just to let you know, most of this lecture has been based on materials, materials I found through um, this website, uh, which is pretty great about the history of synthetic speech. Uh, you can also follow this one to learn a little bit more about it if you want to. Um, and this is a late edition because uh, this is a system that came out just a few years ago. And it was hard to kind of borrow the materials from their website, but I'll show it to you. So there's a Google project, um, which they called WaveNet. 
which kind of goes back to that linear predictive coding idea that I mentioned halfway through this lecture uh, and can produce pretty high quality synthetic speech. So, um, and this also gives you kind of better, um, <clears throat> graphics for how to understand um, this form of synthetic speech. So um, it contrasts between, not between concatenative and formant synthesis, it calls formant synthesis par parametric text-to-speech synthesis. Um, and then it goes through its kind of wave net model here. So this uses what's called a neural network. Uh, and I don't really have time to explain how a neural network works at the end of this lecture, but um, you can read through this if you want to because neural networks are applied in a lot of different um, computer software applications these days for you know generating things like artificial intelligence or automatic speech recognition. Um, but basically the idea with this WaveNet approach is to sort of do the linear predictive coding on a very fine scale so that it can predict every single moment in time, every single sample uh, that's in a particular waveform of an utterance. Um, so it's not really based on that, that those usual source filter approaches to um, synthetic synthesis. It's just um, that we've seen in all of our various examples throughout this lecture. Instead, it's just saying, how, can, how well can I predict particular amplitude values of a waveform based on previous amplitude values of the similar waveforms? Um, so I can give you some examples. Um, they looked at how well people respond to this, um, whether they're listening to uh, English or Mandarin. This is the natural speech in green. Uh, this is concatenative synthesis, this is formant synthesis, and this is the WaveNet system that they've developed. Uh, so we can listen to these. Here's the, a formant synthesis version of this particular sentence. Aspects of the sublime in English poetry and painting, 1770 to 1850. So that's pretty good. Uh, this is concatenative. Aspects of the sublime in English poetry and painting, 1770 to 1850. And you can hear maybe a little bit of weirdness there, but not much. Um, and here's WaveNet. Aspects of the sublime in English poetry and painting, 1770 to 1850. <clears throat> so that sounds really good. It's just kind of funny that it has a little bit of noise in the background for some reason. Aspects of the sublime in English poetry and painting, 1770 to 1850. Um, it's got the same system for Mandarin. Uh, unfortunately, that doesn't mean a lot to me, but it sounds good. Yep, uh, and it has this kind of these funny examples from training the system. Uh, so like the mechanical talking head that we saw at the beginning of the lecture, it kind of uses babble training to, um, so that the system can figure out, you know, whether what it's saying matches up with the target. Uh, so this sounds a little bit like my, you know, infant daughter just talking to herself, but then also... Not at all like that. Hey, the two to say now also very good. Sure, I should see it tell us guys. The language he has the head chain we've going to if it was a pack. Yeah, I don't know if that was based on Dutch or what. Do you ever wish I had a study because it is well? But it's good to have a tire set key. I just wrote a game that's out. Well, if you're not as a judge, do you watch the bar for fire? So, to do so, there you go, and then you can use um. Make different speakers. The avocado is a pear-shaped fruit with leathery skin, smooth edible flesh, and a large stone. The avocado is a pear-shaped fruit with leathery skin, smooth edible flesh, and a large stone. And I guess lastly, because I have talked a bit about music in this class, they have examples of um, kind of training the system to generate music, I guess, um, from scratch. Okay, so have fun learning how to play that on the piano. All right, that's it uh, for this little synthetic speech discussion. And that's it for uh, the semester's lectures as well. I hope you all enjoyed it as much as I do, did and um, or do, because I still enjoy teaching this class, even though it's a weird format. Uh, and then hopefully at some point we'll be able to meet in person and uh, enjoy the beauty of phonetics together. So until then, I'll see you.